jobs. Uh, then I have some lunch, then I dedicate one hour in the afternoon to networking or trying to, you know, reconnect with one person from my major or a professor, something to also incorporate a little bit of networking into your job search. Um, and then maybe in the afternoon, I practice my interview skills. So trying to be a little systematic, maybe it's one day a week, one night a week, um, but trying to, to keep that schedule. And then also keeping your applications organized. Whenever you're applying to a job, um, copying and pasting screenshots or whatever you need to do to capture the job description um, and maintaining that in a folder along with the resume and cover letter, cover letter from, from that you apply to for that job um, all together in a folder like a Google, Google Docs folder is really helpful. Um, you know, I definitely talk to, to folks a lot who are like, I applied to this job. Uh, but the job description has gone. And so now I can't, I don't know what to practice or I kind of forgot what the job was. So really helpful just to, to save some sort of text of the job description so that you can always reference it um, in the future. Maybe when you get that call back, whether it be a few days later or maybe even a few months later. And then I think it's really helpful to, to have a general documentation folder where you can Keep just, you know, all your references that you may need to pull out a, at some point of an interview or job process, whether they be transcripts, um, offer letters, you know, performance reviews can be really helpful as you're thinking about preparing for an interview like, hey, what was feedback um, that I've been given before, you know, what might be important um, accomplishments to share in my interview. So keep those um, in a nice document folder. Any certifications you may need to, to demonstrate or even letters of recommendation and, and references. It's also helpful just to keep track of what applications you're putting out there, um, as well as maybe the date um, of when you applied, how you applied, anyone you've been in contact with. Um, you know, is it time to check in? It's been a few weeks. Maybe this spreadsheet will help. Um, help remind you of kind of which, what the status is of a variety of applications you have. Um, and maybe even some notes of what you learned through that particular process or interview so that as you're moving forward, um, you know, you can continue to learn and maybe update or be a little more strategic about certain parts of your, your job search. So with all those kind of tips and tricks, I uh, wanted to emphasize, we actually have a, uh, an event coming up, the College to Career Bootcamp, Thursday, June 17th, which you can um, RSVP for on Handshake and on that events, pat, events page. And uh, it's basically gonna be a pretty packed day, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., where we cover tons of the different job search you know, aspects. So we touch on resumes and cover letters, we touch on networking, elevator pitch, um, you know, how to prepare for interviews. So we really just, you know, a one, one day packed full of job search success tools and a lot of um, worksheets and it, it's pretty interactive. So, so you'll walk away with some great, um, you know, some, some great resources. There is lunch, so it's not, you know, don't worry, we, we will take some time and, and it's a virtual setting. So um, you'll, have, you'll have some time in the day to, to relax as well. But definitely recommend that if you're just kind of looking to polish up your job search skills and kind of do a, a quick one day um, focus on job search success. So the best way to contact us these days, I would say, is, is via email, csld at sfsu.edu. Um, but also, you know, keep in touch with us on, we're on LinkedIn and Instagram um, and, you know, always posting new information, new, new opportunities and, and events. So with that, um, could probably take a few minutes of questions and I will hang around to the end as well in case anyone wants to throw things in the chat. Thank you so much, my dear. Um, so um, I'm gonna wait. Uh, we did get, I did get a few questions um, uh, to myself to ask you, um, but if anyone does have any other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, so to start with, um, you know, I know you touched on your Instagram um, and a few other of the places people can get um, in contact with you, but for our recent alums, what is the best way to reach out to your office and make an appointment or talk or get someone to talk to about the questions that they have? 
Yeah, I would probably start um, via email, csld at sfsu.edu. That'll be the best way to directly um, address questions pretty quickly. If you feel you know ready to make an appointment and you want to dive right in, you're more than welcome to by signing up on Handshake and just scheduling an appointment and we can start the conversation there too. Awesome, thank you. And um, also, um, this is a question um, from Alexander uh, Marinkov. Um, what is the general feel of CSLD right now regarding students getting hired? Are there a lot of hirings? Is it stagnant? Um, what are some misconceptions you see from um, a lot of us looking at uh, and getting help and getting hired? Yeah, yeah, really good question. I would say over the past couple weeks, uh, we've seen it pick up a lot. Like it's been exciting. I've been hearing from students um, and alumni saying, hey, I got that job or uh, folks are preparing for interviews. So I feel like right now is actually, you know, also just kind of time of the hiring season where it picks up. Um, but I would say it's it's feeling more promising now for sure. So if you've been sort of waiting to see what happens with things, I would say, you know, maybe start picking up your job search right now. It, it seems to be a good time. Well, that's good. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Um, and another question that I received, um, a lot of people from a lot of people are either starting their job search or even starting uh, jobs they may have gotten virtually, which is a very unique experience. Um, yeah. Just from your expertise, um, both with career services and, and even in some of your past professions, um, do you have any top tips for people who maybe are getting to those final steps or even getting ready to start a job or once they do get those jobs virtually um, and kind of, I don't know, getting ingrained and, and kind of going through that on a virtual level? Yeah, it is very unique. Um, I, I will say that, you know, I think almost, just kind of translating what you feel like you would do in an in-person environment and just sort of shifting that and making sure to be intentional about it um, virtually. So for example, if it kind of you can vision walking into that job on the first day and you might walk around the office and go and introduce yourself, you know, trying to kind of maybe speak to your supervisor and say, hey, who are some of the folks we, you know, typically collaborate with or who's on our team? Um, so that you can schedule maybe 15 to 30 minute, you know, in quick introductions. Um, you know, that, that would be one way. And then I think also maybe exploring the HR pages and seeing if they do have any sort of, uh, you know, employer, employee groups or communities that you can kind of start to get involved with virtually just to start feeling like and, and starting to meet people, um, you know, fr from that way, I think can be a way to sort of start integrating a little bit. That's great. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, and it's going to be a, a two part question. Up. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, the first part is, um, what is some what what is some advice you wish you had gotten um, at this point in your life getting ready to graduate from college just about ready to enter the job market and um, uh, also, um, if you could just, um, and I think Charlene can help with this, if we can just put the best email maybe to get in touch with you and career services in the chat, just so people can take advantage of that. Um, I know you'll be here till the end, but I want to make sure everyone has your contact info. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so I just added CSLDs as well as mine. Uh, yeah, what a good question. So best piece of advice, you know, I would say with the gift of uh, hindsight, right? It, it's, it's always a little easier. Um, I kind of with that quick intro probably went almost like a decade of career exploration, you know, professionally trying to figure out what made sense. And there's all the different factors, right? There's your, your skills, what you're good at, but also what you're passionate and interested in. And then there's your values and kind of, and, and different time of life, sort of what your priorities are. Um, I would say I focused I started my career just kind of with what I was interested in. I wanted to travel. And so whatever met that kind of, you know, goal I, I stuck with, um, which ended me up at a global international firm, which I had no interest in uh, finance numbers or, or any of that. So it was a funny fit, but it checked my box of, you know, travel and it, it led me to being able to work in Spain. So it was well worth it. But I think I ultimately kind of said after that experience, yeah, but what what feels more right to kind of 
what my values are um, and what I'm interested in. And I always knew it was kind of more helping type professions. Um, marketing wasn't where I wanted to be. So I finally sort of after a few years of, you know, in, enjoying the ride said, okay, what would actually, you know, make me energized to, to go to work every day? Um, so I think maybe exploring values a little more in the beginning of, as you're starting your career, um, it, it's helpful just to keep in mind to make sure that ultimately, you know, whatever you're doing is, is making you feel um, complete, I guess is, is a good way to put it. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation, my dear. Um, I believe you said that you'll be staying until the end of the program. So um, if uh, anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, but for now, um, it is definitely um, my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Lauren Borlier. Lauren is an alumna, an inspirational speaker, success coach, and founder of uh, Soul Savvy. Her mission is to ignite the fire of a dream in every person she meets and help them discover their full potential. Lauren has spent over a decade in education, first as a teacher and then as a literacy coach in Berkeley Public Schools, and now as a life coach helping people achieve their goals. She is a proud SF State Gator and has created the Lauren Burley Scholarship in History to support undergraduate students who are positive influences to others. Uh, please join me in welcoming Lauren. Hi there, welcome. I am so privileged to get to do this with all of you today as you start to discover what it is you want to do now that you are graduating and you're on the road to what's next for your life. So I don't know about you all, I might be wearing a suit, but I'm also wearing fuzzy socks and slippers. So happy Friday afternoon. And hopefully this, what I'm about to share with you, energizes you for your weekend, but also for what's going to happen next in your life. So when I was a little girl, I would run into the living room on Saturday mornings and we had this thing called a wall unit. So I don't know about all of you who are currently graduating, but when I was little, your TV was about this wide going from front to back. And you had to have these big consoles in your living room to support this giant TV. So we always called it a wall unit and it had doors that you would open and then there would be this big TV sitting in there. And I would be running into the living room on Saturday mornings and the first show I would turn on was Joyce Meyer Ministries. Now that might sound funny, like what six-year-old kid goes and watch ministry on Saturday morning? And I didn't care about the religion, but I would look at this powerful woman standing up on stage in her shoulder pads because it was the 80s. And she would just be inspiring people that they were more and they were greater than that. And as a little girl, I would think I want to do something like that, but I didn't want to be a preacher. So life went on and then comes middle school. School comes, I'd run in the house wearing my Adidas shell toes, had my Jansport backpack because now it's the 90s. And I would walk into my living room and the first thing I would watch was MTV. And then I would watch Law and Order. And I would watch Law and Order and I would sit there and I would watch like the attorneys in the courtroom litigating, talking passionately about what they were fighting for and arguing for. And I would think I would wanna do something like that. I would want to be inspiring others and motivating and talking about what mattered to me, but I didn't really know if I wanted to be a lawyer. So I explored that and I did debate and I took political science classes and I did all that. And then there came a point in my life where Barack Obama was running for president and I was super passionate, passionate about his message of hope. I worked for his campaign. I did all sorts of things. At this point, I was already at San Francisco state and I would look at him and I would think I would want to do something like that but I didn't wanna be a politician. And one of the things that I never discovered along this journey of watching other people and wanting to do what they do was I never noticed that the tie that bound all those things together was public speaking, was inspiring others. That it wasn't really about a role or a job. For me, it was about the feeling of what my purpose was. I didn't have the courage or the self-esteem or the self-image at that point in my life to look at somebody like Barack Obama or Joyce Meyer or the lawyers on TV and think that I could do something like that someday. So rather than going after what I dreamed of doing, I played small and I went after what I thought I could do. For me, I didn't believe I could have that bigger version dream or bigger version life. So I decided that I was going to become a teacher. Now, being a teacher is no way playing small. 
it just, it's actually one of the hardest jobs in the world. But for me, it wasn't my purpose or my passion. When I became a school teacher, I was fulfilled in the beginning because I knew I was inspiring the kids that I was teaching. But still the happiest days of my life as a teacher were the days where I got to speak in front of the other teachers or back to school night. Like I was the one teacher on staff who was excited about back to school night. In fact, two times on back to school night, I got a standing ovation from the parents. So you can, the kids never gave me a standing ovation. So you can see from my passion, it was all about public speaking. And yet I couldn't allow myself to have that dream. And then in seven years into my teaching career, I was married, I had a house, I had two dogs, you know, life from the outside in looked good. But seven years into my teaching career, I found my own personal life in complete and utter disarray. I found myself after one year of marriage going through a divorce. I had a husband who told me, you bring nothing to the table. He left, I lost my house. I was in deep credit card debt, deep student loan debt. And I ended up moving back in with my parents. I'm sharing this personal part of the story with you because I know for many of you, you've faced and overcome struggles. You've had people in your life who told you you're not good enough or you bring nothing or you can't do that. And I want you to know that no matter what your history is or where you're starting from, that you can achieve greatness truly beyond your wildest dreams if you just have the right tools. So I'm sitting in what I felt like a bomb had gone off in my life and I'm sitting in the rubble and I'm looking at all this failure, all this debt, marriage that didn't work, so much shame around not being able to make that work and what happened to me, sitting in a job that I no longer loved. And I was privileged to go to an event like this where there was a speaker who talked about having a vision. And I was sitting there thinking about the things I always dreamed of doing. And she said, if you could just wave a magic wand, what would it be for you? And I thought about Joyce Meyer and I thought about the lawyers on TV and I thought about Barack Obama and I realized a very deep understanding that I had failed at a life that I didn't even want. And so all that playing it safe and my life was still in disarray. So I made it a mission in my own mind that no matter what I did from that point on, I was going to fail at something that I was absolutely in love with. When I founded my company, Soul Savvy, I was literally sitting in my parents' basement. Maybe some of you are in that life stage right now as you're graduating. I was sitting in my parents' basement thinking, my dream and my passion is to inspire others. I don't know what title that is. I don't know what job that is, but I'm going to find a way to do that. When I founded Soul Savvy, I had no money. I had a laptop. I had my parents' basement, and I had my voice. This year, Soul Savvy will do between $700,000 and a million dollars in revenue. We've established the Lauren Brolier Scholarship in history, and we've helped thousands of people, mainly women, but thousands of people to tap into a life that they would love living. And I say this not to impress you, but to impress upon you that no matter where you're starting or what anybody has told you, with the right tools, you can create whatever you want to have in your life. And I'm going to give you two tools today that I believe will help you know how to do that. The Persian poet Rumi said, it's as if a king has sent you from a far and distant land to do one specific task. You could do a thousand other things while you're here, but if you don't do the one thing for which he sent you, it's going to feel as if you've done nothing. Now you can take whatever you want out of his, it's as if a king has sent you from a far and distant land. You can think about if you're a faith-based person, you could think about that as God or a creator, universe, infinite intelligence. If you're more scientific minded, you can think of it as energy, waves and particles, however you want to think of it. Let's just all admit that showing up on planet earth in an earth suit, not one of us was given a manual for that. I think all of us wake up in human life and go, what am I doing here? It's not like any of us wake up and know what the purpose for our life is. That's part of the human journey. But when Rumi says it's as if you're in this far and distant land to do one specific task, I don't believe that what Rumi is saying is be an architect, be an engineer, be a teacher, work at Google. I believe what Rumi is saying is to be you. The one specific task, the only task that is truly yours is to be you. If you notice, I want you to notice this very, very closely. In the whole history of this universe that's been around for billions of years and the whole future of this universe, there has never been and never will be another you. 
you're the only one. And that one specific task that Rumi talks about in his poetry is to let that full expression of you with a capital Y come forth for what you came here to do. And I hope that what I share with you today is going to help you to do that just a little bit more. And my dares answer to the last question about finding something that fulfills you is so spot on for what I'm going to share with you next. So I'm going to share my screen, get started here. Bear with me as I navigate the, the slides here. So we're going to talk about a vision for greatness today. The first thing I want to share with you is that you will find that the quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask. When I first heard that quote, it just sounded kind of boring to me. But let me break this apart. Let me give you some examples of this. When we've had hardship or struggle or things aren't going our way, I mean, the, those of you who are graduating this year did your whole last year of university or two years during COVID. I mean, that's not an easy thing. Nobody knew how to navigate that. And we can ask a question. We could ask, why is life so unfair? Why is this happening? And trust me, when my life was in shambles, it was so uh, such a strong pull to want to go back to that question, why? Why is this so unfair? But I learned how to ask a different question. It's one I'm going to invite you to if you've ever faced challenges or your job search is feeling challenging or whatever it is you're going through. The same question with a different spin is, what can I do with all I've learned and all this strength I've had to find within myself? What can I do to support and help others now that I know this? That determines a completely different quality of life than why is it so unfair? Different question. You could be asking yourself right now, what job can I get to help me you know, pay my student loans, use my degree? I could ask that question and it would determine a certain quality of life. But I could ask a different question. With my gifts and talents and what I feel like is my purpose and the things that I'm in love with, what steps could I take to find that position for myself and make a generous salary doing it? And the quality of your life will follow. So I'm going to give you two questions today that are part of a process that I hope will help you to uncover what the purpose, the passion is behind this job search so you can find yourself in alignment with who you really want to be and what you really want to do and what you want to serve in this world as you go along. So... We've been trained, all of us, to ask the wrong questions in some situations. It's not because our parents didn't care about us or our teachers didn't care about us. It's not because we're not smart. It's just the way most of us were trained to think. I think about my dad. He was born in the middle of World War II. He was an older dad. My dad was born in the middle of World War II. He wasn't thinking, I can start a company from a laptop. He was doing the best he could to survive with the one pair of shoes that he had growing up in, in a poor town in the middle of the Imperial Valley. So it's not like it's anybody's fault that we didn't learn how to, that we learned these questions. It's just the evolution of humankind, I think. So some of the wrong questions that we ask ourselves that get us into these, uh, how do I say it, more constricted professions that maybe aren't the right ones for us. The first question is when we start asking ourselves, well, based on my past, what do I think I can do? You have so much potential and greatness in you in this lifetime, you won't even be able to explore it all. So whatever happened in the past, like I said, I was broke living in my parents' basement when I founded my company. Don't base your future on the past. Another question that is going to lead you down a path that you don't want to go down post-graduation is what do others believe I'm capable of? If you think about the most inspiring people in your life, the most inspiring teachers, one of my teachers, maybe you've had her at San Francisco State, she's still here, in the history department was Dr. Eva Shepherd Wolf. And she always pushed me, always, always pushed me to be better. It was never like, oh, that was a good try. It was like, okay, come on, what's next? And so and someone like that believe in their belief, but people who don't believe in you don't ask what they think you're capable of. Another question, what do my parents think I should do? For any parents on here, sorry if you're on here, but you're the highest authority on you. Your parents can give you advice, but if it doesn't light you up, it's never gonna lead you to success. What's reasonable and what's practical? Reasonable and practical actions lead to reasonable and practical results. Greatness comes from saying, it might not be reasonable to people who haven't done it before, but if I can dream it up, I can do it. 
So if it's not to ask these questions, you're going, okay, Lauren, if I'm not going to ask these questions, what questions should I be asking? I'm going to share with you the number one question, and it's our first tool for today that I would like you to explore as you start your job search and as you start your post-graduation path. What would I love? This is not just a question you can ask about your job search, but this is a question you can ask every day as you wake up and you have this void of a thing that we call a day that you get to fill and you get to create. What would I love? Would you love to be working for a company that has a mission? Would you love to be helping people? Would you love to walk into an office where there's, I'm thinking about those offices that have the plants and like the chill rooms and the relaxation spaces. What would you love? Not what job title has this thing in it. Let's start with what you would love first and then create the, the path that's gonna match what you would love. I like to think of a career as vocation. Vocare translates literally to calling. I believe that each of us has a calling inside of our heart. My calling was to be a speaker and inspire others. Maybe you know your calling or maybe you're just discovering it. I once had a mentor that said, the calling you feel inside your heart is the prayers of all the people on this planet you would help by means of fulfilling that. I, was, I had the privilege of being mentored by a woman named Mary Morrissey. She has done so many amazing things in her life. She's spoken at the UN. She's worked with the Dalai Lama extensively. She's worked with Martin Luther King's children on different peace initiatives. And I've had some people come to my classes that also attend Mary's classes. And I've had people say to me, I understand it so much better when you explain it. And I'm thinking to myself, no, Mary's much better at explaining this. She's been doing it for 50 years. But going back to the Rumi quote and what I was saying to you about only you can express in the way you express, there will be people and places and jobs and opportunities that are meant for you, that resonate with you, where people have to hear your message and what it is that you do and your skills and talents. So I believe that each of us has a calling. And I believe that work, going to a job, whatever that may be, is love made visible. Whatever you feel like is yours to create, whether it's coding or engineering or architecture, or working for a nonprofit, that that is your energy made visible in the world. And I would invite you to think this is about purpose. I'm going to create a vision for what I'd like, and then I'm going to see what's in harmony, what kind of jobs and opportunities are in harmony with that purpose. So with this question, what would I love? I'm going to take you through an activity right now. In this first part, you could take notes, but mainly I want you to visualize. And then I'm going to take you into uh, some actual writing you could do around this vision for your life. So I want you to think first and foremost, what would I absolutely love in terms of a working environment? Would I love to be working from home? Would I love to be back in person? What would I love for a working environment for myself? Would I have a client who, when we created the vision for her career, she would love to be working outside the majority of the time. And we found her something that matched that. What would you love in terms of colleagues? Who, what would their personalities be like? Are you in office together? Are they more cerebral people and you have deep conversations? Are they other people with the same interests? Are there people who like to go out after work and hang out? What would you dream up for colleagues? What would you love in terms of compensation or pay? If you were going to be generously compensated for your talents, what would that look like? How would you like to use your gifts and talents? If you notice the things that you're really good at, things that people say, oh my gosh, you're so good at that. You're a natural. How would you like to be using those? And finally, what would you love in terms of impact? What will your work do for the world, do for others, do for your company, do for your community, do for you. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I'm going to invite you to just imagine for a second that you have a magic wand. And don't worry, I'm going to tell you what next step to take. We're not just going to dream up, although dreaming is important. I'm also going to give you a step to take in terms of this. And I would invite all of you to go work with uh, the career services department so that you can take this vision and make it more visible for yourself. 
But I want you to think for a moment that it's 2024. We're going to put it three years out because the way that the subconscious mind works and the conscious mind works is that if I say, what job will you get next week? Your system in your nervous system is going to get a little bit worked up around that. But with the question, what would I love? If I say, just imagine it's three years from now, your mind doesn't know what you can create in that amount of time. And so it'll let you more play. So it's 2024 and you're so happy and grateful now that, and we're going to state it in the present tense. Now that you what? So let me give you an example of this. It's 2024 and I'm so happy and grateful now that I run a team at Google. And I work with a team of the brightest minds in technology, and we create creative solutions for this kind of framework in our industry. Or you might say, I'm, it's 2024, and I'm so happy and grateful now that I work for a nonprofit that works with youth, youth in San Francisco, and I can use my gifts and talents networking with the community. But I want you to go ahead, and I want you to frame what you already know about what you would love to do in a vision. And I'll give you, give, take about a minute to do that. And I suppose, I don't know if this is cool, but I suppose you could also type it in the chat um, if you wanted to, so that we could frame, hold that with you and frame that with you. And you could claim what it is that you would love, but go ahead and take 30 seconds and whatever you want to write it in the notes on your iPhone or in the chat or on a piece of paper, write down what you would love in 2024. If you could just wave a magic wand and this was your dream vision. All right, so make sure you have a sentence or two there. All right, so now I'm gonna take you into the good news. The good news is you couldn't even dream it up if it wasn't possible. If you think about like the Wright brothers, they have a bicycle shop. There's another dude out over at Harvard at the Smithsonian Institute who's been given a $50,000 grant by the government to build the first plane. The Wright brothers are two brothers. They've got no money and a bicycle shop. And they decide that they're going to fly this plane. And they did it. And they were the first ones ever to do it. Everybody else said, if God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. But the truth is the human mind can't even dream it up if it's not possible. If you think about electricity, 200 years ago, less than that, we were wiring our house by oil, oil lamps. That's how we were lighting our homes at night. The universe was already wired for electricity, but no one had an awareness of it. And I promise you that whatever your dream is or whatever you would love to achieve in your life, it's already in the wiring of the universe. You just have to tap your awareness into it. So let me give you tool number two. Tool number two is to source ideas. So you've got this vision. Maybe you're working at Google or at a nonprofit. In my case, I just knew I wanted to help people. I didn't even really know what the role would be. So don't worry so much about the job worry about the what. This is what I would love for my working environment, right? This is where I'd love to work. And now we're going to start sourcing ideas. So you have this little mini vision. And the question I want you to ask yourself now, this is question number two. Remember I said questions determine the quality of life. What step can I take from where I am with what I have to move me in the direction of this vocation vision? What step can I take from where I am with what I have? The where I am with what I have is an important part of the question, because if you think you have to do something else before you can stay, take a step, you'll end up stalling yourself on your search for a long time. So we're just going to source ideas for this vision that you just came up with. And what I want you to do is I want you to write down every idea without filter. The logical mind will want to say, that's not a good idea. This is a good idea. I suggest you just get all the ideas out first. One time, let me go back just one slide and show you. One time I was asking myself this same question. If you know what the exact position is you'd love, you can ask, what step can I take from where I am with what I have to get the such and such role at this nonprofit or whatever it is that you're looking for? So one day I was doing this process with myself. Soul Savvy was already an established company and I was just wanting to get more speaking engagements. So I asked myself the question, it was back in 2018. I wrote, what step can I take with where I am with what I have to get 24 speaking engagements in 2018? And I just wrote down without filter every idea that came to my mind. And one of the ideas was post your blog on LinkedIn. Now the logical mind wants to say, what is posting a blog on LinkedIn gonna have to do with speaking engagements? 
this is why it's important to write down every idea without filter because I went ahead and it had some energy to it. I wrote down that idea on LinkedIn to, I posted my blog on LinkedIn and a gentleman in the same industry, coaching industry reached out to me and he said, Hey, we haven't connected. Would you like to have a cup of coffee? I said, sure. At that event, he's older. He's in his seventies, older than me. He's in his seventies at that coffee. He said, uh, I know you love public speaking. You're a great public speaker. I have 18 paid speaking engagements that I no longer want. Would you like to take that over for me? Thank God I didn't listen to the part of my mind that said, oh, what is posting a blog on LinkedIn going to do? This is why I'm encouraging you right now for your vision, write down every idea of a step that you could take to do that thing. Maybe the first step is to reach out to career services. Maybe it's to update your resume. Maybe it's some other idea that comes out of left field. Go ahead and take 10 seconds now and just write down every idea you have for how you might achieve this vision. See if you can get at least three or four ideas. And then this I, next step is pick at least one to act on today. Don't wait. If it was post on LinkedIn, do it. If it was send an email to career services, do it. If it was get out the resume, do it. And you can use this process time and time again to create new actions to serve your vision. So I have a gift for each of you that's on this tonight. I asked the team if I could give you a gift. And originally I was going to give you my ebook. And then I came up with something way better than that. So what I'm going to give to you today, and I've made a special website just for the Gator alum, is I'm going to give you a ticket to my full day event, which takes this purpose process and this uh, how to create results using the brainstorm and many other tools to my full day virtual workshop. So I've made a website page just for you, soulsavvy.org slash gators. And you can go ahead and you can get that ticket now. And the ticket comes with an event kit. It's like this big swag package that we send you for our event. Um, and these tickets are not on sale to the public yet. So you're the first ones to get them. And that's my gift to you completely free. You'll see how to register when you go to that site. So before I step to questions, I want to tell you one more story. It's a San Francisco story that I think will absolutely inspire you to how, how to take this vision and live into it and take steps toward it every day. So for those of you, some of you may or may not know Jerry Rice, but Jerry Rice was the truly the best wide receiver of all time. And he played for the San Francisco 49ers. And Jerry Rice was at this point in his career about to retire. It's his last year. Um, well, it was his last year on the 49ers. And he already had the record for the most receptions in the NFL. I have a, uh, a friend that knows a man named Bo Eason. Bo Eason does a one-man show and he was in the NFL himself. And he was going to training camp for the first time as a rookie on the San Francisco 49ers. And he decided he wanted to be the best. He wanted to lean into greatness. So Bo Eason showed up for training camp at 7.30 at Candlestick, Candlestick Park in San Francisco, even though it didn't start till 9 a.m. He shows up at 7.30, he's lacing up his cleats. And for those of you who may know of Candlestick Park, it was so foggy at Candlestick Park. Bo Eason said, I'm sitting in the fog, I'm lacing up my cleats. And I look out on the field and I realize like there's somebody already on the field. It's an hour and a half before training camp starts. And he said, the fog started to part and standing on the field was Jerry Rice, the best wide receiver of all time, an hour and a half early for practice. And he was doing sprints. So Bo Eason decided that he was going to watch greatness. Jerry Rice to him was the model of greatness. And so he's decided at this training camp all day, he's going to watch what Jerry Rice does. He said they were doing a warm-up activity where the quarterback would throw the ball, someone would run out, catch the ball, run back in, toss it, toss it back over to the quarterback. Simple warm-up activity. He said all the rookies were so proud of themselves for being in the NFL at training camp that they would just kind of like saunter out on the field. You know, they've got their swagger and catch the ball and then kind of saunter back, toss it to the quarterback. Now, just as an aside, the average lifespan of an NFL player is two years. And because many people don't know how to tap into that greatness. So Bo Eason said he watched when Jerry Rice got up. He said when the quarterback threw the ball, boom, Jerry Rice sprinted onto the field, 
got the football, didn't run it back to the quarterback, ran all the way down to the opposite end zone in a sprint, made a touchdown, and then sprinted all the way back and handed the ball to the quarterback. So Bo was wondering, are all these rookies going to look at greatness and follow what they do? And he said, not one of them followed Jerry Rice's lead. At the end of the training camp, he got the courage to walk up to Jerry Rice and ask him, first of all, I'm so happy to be on your team. My name is Bo. Why is it that every single warm up we do, even though it's not required, you run all the way to the end zone? And Jerry Rice said something so profound and something I want to leave with you today. He said, when the ball touches these hands, it's a touchdown every time. And Bo said, but you're already the best. Why do you keep doing that? And Jerry Rice said, because you don't stop doing the things that made you great in the first place. So whatever the touchdown is of your own life, I see each and every one of you every day as you do your search, as you lean into your vision, taking the ball to the end zone of your own life, knowing that that is what creates greatness. So I will pass it back to Nisha. Um, I think we're, we're going to do questions and don't forget to get your ticket. If you'd love to join me, soulsavvy.org slash gators. Wow. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, I feel very inspired. I hope everyone else feels uh, equally as inspired. Um, so we already do have a question um, in the Q&A. Um, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, how did you become certified as a life coach? And what was that experience like? Duration, challenges, if any, um, et cetera. Great question. So when I created my vision, I didn't actually know what a life coach was. In fact, I kind of, I'm a pretty practical person. So I had this very woo woo kind of uh, stereotype about life coaches. And so I didn't know really what a life coach was. But when I started to lean into my vision of helping people, especially other women who had had low felt self-esteem or felt less, less them, and I heard about life coaching, I realized that it's a lot about helping people create different results and um, inspiring and speaking. And so I thought, wow, that's right up my alley. I got certified by a uh, company called Brave Thinking Institute. Brave Thinking Institute is all about transformational coaching. So it's not about career necessarily or business, but about any time a person wants to create more in their life. There's lots of different places to get certified as a life coach. Um, Proctor Gallagher Institute would be another one. Um, John Maxwell Leadership Coaching would be another one. Um, but life coaching is in terms of challenges for me, it hasn't been a challenge because I'm, it's so on purpose for what I want to do, but for some coaches, you have to also be the marketer and you have to be writing your email copy and your website and things like that. It's kind of the plight of the entrepreneur that you're kind of a one woman show or a one man show or one person show to start. And so I think the challenges are the things that maybe aren't in your zone of genius, like accounting and financing and all those other parts of being an entrepreneur can be challenging. But if you love service and you love what you do, I think it makes those parts easier because I know my website, my email marketing is important for people to be able to find me so I can help them. So if you can keep the mindset of all this accounting and emailing and backlog, even though it doesn't seem like part of helping people, it is helping people, even the marketing portion of it. So I say those would be the challenges is being a one woman show for the beginning part of it. Thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, and this was one of the questions someone um, uh, messaged me directly. Um, a lot of this stuff, it, these are such great tools, um, but I also know that when the going gets tough or when you're very stressed, sometimes it can be really hard to remember that we have these tools and remember to actually act on them. Um, so do you have any advice of, you know, when, when you are stressed, maybe you're about to graduate and you're entering into a job market or, or when just personal stuff kind of overwhelms us, you know, how do we make sure to really use these tools? Because I think those are also the times when we need them the most. Yeah. So this answer may not be the most satisfying answer, and yet it's to me the best answer that I know. I in my life have suffered deeply in my early years, especially when I was graduating from anxiety. And anxiety is something that comes on base because of stress. And what I learned, especially in this career as I'm helping people navigate challenging times often, is that when we get stressed, 
our body is producing a lot of cortisol, a lot of adrenaline, and that actually causes a lot of overstimulation of your nervous system. Your nervous system actually takes longer to heal in some regards than actually a broken foot. Like your nervous system, when it gets frayed, it takes a lot of cooling down to become relaxed. So the best thing I could say when you're graduating and there's a lot of stress, first and foremost, is to give your nervous system some support. And actually as a business owner and an employer, and then when, when things get stressful, I prescribe this to myself a lot. And that is to do 15 minutes a day of relaxation. I don't mean something like watching TV or scrolling the phone, but where there's no stimulation, where you're just listening to either a guided meditation or like forest sounds or, you know, whatever it is that relaxes you or to just lay down with your eyes closed for 15 minutes. And let me share with you, and this is great for job interviews too, a breathing technique that you can use to almost instantly get out of fight or flight, which most of us in, especially in the United States are living mostly in fight or flight, which is our, um, sympathetic nervous, nervous system to get you back into rest, digest, create. So you want, what you want to do is you want to breathe in through your nose and then out through your mouth, like you're blowing through a straw. And if you do this three or four times, your body starts to know that you're safe because if you were biologically were programmed to the days when we were like running from lions and saber tooth tigers. So that's kind of how our nervous system's pretty reptilian. And if you're breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, it just triggers your mind to go, oh, okay, must be safe. And so that really can help us calm. So I would be doing that before anything else. And then to get back to the tool, to get back to the tool is just to remember that there is a part of you that's greater than anything you're facing. And how I know that 100% certainty is that you have a 100% success rate of getting through tough days because you're still here. So I just remind myself that there is a part of me that's greater because I've gotten through all, everything I've been through so far. And that can really help to remind me to get back in the mindset of, I am more than this. Thank you. That was um, really excellent. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, there was one in the chat um, and this you kind of touched on this a little bit already, but um, what do you find most challenging about your job, even though you love what you do um, and how do you cope with um, and how do you cope with those challenges? Yeah. So in, in my career, we use a lot of, in, in Soul Savvy, we use a lot of uh, Facebook advertising and challenges and those kind of things to get people interested in what we're doing. And as you know, the world of online is always unpredictable. So like I was in Facebook jail, like for the whole month of April on my ad account, they didn't, I didn't know what I did. I, I, I have no idea why, but you know, those kind of things can be tricky. So the marketing and advertising world, it doesn't always go the way that you hoped. And that can sometimes be frustrating when you're really trying to help and reach people. And what I know from what I do is there's always, there are infinite number of possibilities to achieve any certain goal. So the way that I get back on track is I go, okay, if I can't get on Facebook or I can't, this path didn't work, what next? What else could we do to, to fulfill our mission? Awesome. And I think um, for our last question, um, and this is a little selfish, it's, it's my question. <laughs> so, um, but if anyone has anything, please um, go ahead and put it into the chat though. Um, um, I, Lauren, I'm not sure if you'll be available to maybe answer some people via chat as well for the rest to. of the program. Um, yeah. But I know that you just started um, a scholarship here at SF State. Um, and would you just mind talking a little bit about it? Because I think it's really awesome um, the way that you thought about the scholarship. And um, I would love yeah. for people to know about it. So I was a student of the history department and I was always inspired. We would have this end of the year banquet every year. And I was always inspired by the people who had established scholarships. And just recently I was thinking about how in the back of my mind, that, that was always something that I just dreamed of doing someday. And I thought, why can't I do it now? So I reached out to the history department and it was my dream to, I always felt I didn't come from a family that had graduated from college. I didn't come from a family where women really had voices or were seen as much. Um, I didn't come from money or anything like that. And so when I was going to San Francisco State, I always felt like maybe I was not as smart as the people around me or like professors would use big words and I'd be like looking around like, does everybody else know what that means? And I always just felt like, um, like I didn't belong somehow. And so when I established the scholarship, I wanted the scholarship to go to maybe not the person with the highest GPA, but the two students in the department in undergraduate who were a positive influence on the learning environment. 
because what I have learned in my life is where I don't make up for in my smarts, I definitely can make up for in my positive positivity and my mindset. So the first scholarship is going out to two, two recipients uh, this just I think this week or the week after. And um, we will continue to deliver that scholarship to two students every year moving forward. That's really amazing. Um, I, I know just from reading the chat here um, and something that I value, I mean, kindness is so important. I think it's really great that you um, prioritize that <laughs> in your scholarship. I think that's really important. So um, thank you, Lauren. That was really amazing. Um, again, I definitely feel inspired based off of what I'm reading. So does everyone else. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, but now it's time uh, to, to sort of close out our program. We're gonna play a quick game of Kahoot trivia. Um, Charlene went ahead and uh, posted the instructions on how to download the app um, and also get it um, onto your desktop by going to kahoot.it. And then uh, once you put the pin up, you'll be able to enter it. As a reminder, the top three winners will win in a SF State swag bag. So be sure to reach out to us if you end up winning so we can confirm the best address to send that to you. Um, but now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and alumna, uh, Charlene Del Muro, who will be hosting our trivia game. Welcome, Charlene. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our trivia game. We are going to play it on Kahoot. And the pin number is 426-2010. And you can either join at kahoot.it or if you have the Kahoot app, you can enter the pin there. And we'll just give people a couple of moments to uh, queue up. Okay, and it looks like we have more names popping up now. Okay, and we'll give people about 10 more seconds and then we will start the game. And um, our first question is a icebreaker question. It is not a um, scored question. And so it isn't for points. It's just to get you warmed up and used to the game. Okay, so we'll give everyone about five more seconds and then we will start with our first question. Okay, and here we go. Uh, question number one again is a non-point question. SF State Gators, are you ready? I was born ready. Game on. Hold up, I need a little bit more time or chomp. Okay, and so that was our icebreaker question. And now we are moving into the uh, questions that are for points. So for question number two, this is the start of our points round and competition. And we'll just skip through our winner's board as there aren't any points on it yet. And what year was SF State's first graduating class? Was it 1900, 1901, 1902, or 1903? Okay, and the correct answer is 1901. Let's see where we're at with our winner's board. And it looks like Mars is in first place, followed by Carly in second, and Kelly in third place. Now let's go on to our next question. In Lauren's presentation, tool number one was, what would I, and is it enjoy, hate, prefer, or love?
Okay, and the correct answer is love. Now let's see where we're at with our winner's board. Oh, and Kelly has moved up into first place. Carly is on a winning streak and then Gia is now in third place. Let's move on to our next question. What is the name of SF State's career platform to make appointments, attend events, and search for jobs? Is it Gator Connect, Handshake, SF State Careers, or Gator Jobs? Okay, and the correct answer is handshake. And let's see where we're at with our winners. Oh, and now Carly is in first place, followed by Kelly, and then Gia, who is starting with the winner streak. And let's go on to our next question. Einstein said this to which former SFSU faculty member? Slow down, professor. I've always had trouble with math. Was it George Gibson, Peter Kristoff, Robert Thornton, or Alexander C. Roberts. Okay, and the correct answer is Robert Thornton. And let's see where we're at with our winners. Oh, and Kelly has moved up into first place and Gia is still on a streak and moving into second. And then we have Alex Marinkov moving into third. Now let's learn a little bit more about Robert Thornton. He was the first Dean of SF State's School of Science and the university's first African-American Dean. A theoretical physicist, Thornton worked with Albert Einstein before joining the SF State faculty in 1956. And now on to our next question. What does Lauren define vocation as? And there's more than one right answer here. So choose one of the right answers and you will get points for either one. And they are love made visible, purpose, your career plan or professional success. Okay, and the two correct answers were love made visible and purpose. And now let's see where we're at with our winners. Oh, and Gia has advanced into first place on her streak, followed by Alex Marinkoff in second place, and then Kelly is in third place. Now let's go to our next question. What is one important step for job search success? And again, there is more than one correct answer. So just choose one and you will get the points if it is the correct answer. Um, join a professional network, send the same application to all employers, buy a new wardrobe or practice interviews. Okay, and the two correct answers are join a professional network and practice interviews. And now let's move on to our winner's board and let's see where we're at. Oh, and Gia is still in first place, followed by Carly in second and then Alex Marinkov in third place. And now let's go on to our next question. Okay, and this is our final question. What is a group of alligators called? Is it a Basque, a pack, a congregation or a herd? And the correct answer is a congregation. 
And now let's go to our winner's podium to see who our winners are. And in third place, we have Linz. And in second place, we have Carly. And in first place, we have our grand prize winner is Gia. So congratulations to all of you. You will win a uh, Gator swag bag. And um, if you could please put your first and last name in the chat, that way we can make sure that we correctly identify you and can get you your Gator goodie bag. All right, thanks everyone for playing. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Um, uh, thank you all for playing and congratulations to all of our winners. Um, but that is our program for today. Um, I wanna thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon and I hope that you found our presentations helpful today. I wanna give a big thank you to my dear Sirhondo and the CSLD team and Lauren Berlier for their, for their presentations and helpful information. I know I for one certainly got something out of today so I really hope that everyone else did too. Um, I would also like to thank my colleagues, Ken Mishiro and Charlene Del Muro, who helped make this event run so smoothly. We will send a follow-up email that will have some information to a, few of the to a few of the resources mentioned today. But if you have any questions about resources available to alums, or even if you're still a student getting ready to graduate, please don't hesitate to reach out to the alumni office at alumni at sfsu.edu, or you can reach out to me directly at nchohan at sfsu.edu. We're gonna put both of those uh, in the chat, um, but thank you all so much and have a great afternoon.